thank you very much, and uh, it's nice to greet you here from um, snowy Rochester. I'm sure the weather is a little bit nicer there. What I'm going to do today is try to give you a flavor for how paleomagnetic observations can be used to define motions of plates, hotspots, and um, talk a little bit about the, the motion of the entire solid Earth. So let's just jump right in. I'll uh, take the next slide, and we'll just look at an overview. We'll concentrate on this, um, this topic of paleomagnetic investigations, but I want to make it topical, obviously, in the sense of the things that you've been discussing and talk pretty much about motion of the Hawaiian hotspot. But we'll break, branch off at a few places and either um, talk very briefly or perhaps in a little bit more depth about some particular issues. Uh, you can think of these in, in, in terms of tutorials on things, for example, like how we know the Earth's magnetic field um, is mainly dipolar, uh, studies that um, we have to tell us about its geometry, which is very important then if you want to use the Earth's magnetic field for determining past uh, latitudes. Uh, well, I'll talk a little bit about the difference between remote sensing data versus more standard paleomagnetic data, and um, we'll talk a little bit about polar wander. We'll um, go through the story of, of how Leg 197 was put together. Um, then I'll talk um, toward the end about some consistency tests uh, using paleomagnetic data from that leg um, to look at global paleomagnetic data and uh, in particular plate circuits. And then we'll uh, end with talking uh, briefly about some candidate processes for the nature of, of the causes in uh, hotspot bends and even some uh, future data sets. So we'll take the next slide. Um, as an introduction, I think you're all aware at this point that the Hawaiian hotspot has figured uh, prominently in many of our ideas of, of geodynamics, how plates move, and in fact um, a few years ago I looked at um, all of the introductory textbooks that were available to me at that time and every one of them used the Hawaiian hotspot and its bend as an indicator of um, plate motion. Uh, next. These ideas, of course, go back to J. Tuzo Wilson, who uh, proposed the uh, hotspot idea for, um, particularly for Hawaii, next. But it was really Jason Morgan who uh, suggested that we could use hotspots like Hawaii for a reference frame that um, really uh, brought in the idea of things like the Hawaiian Emperor Ben uh, being uh, due to a change in plate motion. Next. Um, Obviously, the Hawaiian Emperor Ben is a dramatic feature, um, as, as seen in this projection and in the classic interpretation, as you know, um, we have the uh, Hawaiian chain being formed as um, above a fixed hotspot, and then the Hawaiian Emperor Ben, particularly the northward treading Emperor Seamounts, uh, as reflecting a change um, uh, in the actual plate um, uh, motion direction. Now, next slide. Um, what I think is not really appreciated in, in um, even among professionals is that this is a very old argument. It goes back um, now 30 years and that shortly after Jason Morgan proposed using hotspots as a frame of reference, uh, it was challenged. Uh, that is, hotspot fixity was challenged in three papers. Um, and one way it was challenged was using uh, the, the concept of uh, plate circuits, and that's just shown in this little cartoon. And that concept essentially is that if we have plates that are separated by spreading ridges, we can, um, through rotations, combine data uh, between those plates. So in the example on the bottom, we could go from India and, and then all the way over to um, uh, Europe by a plate circuit, each one of those plates separated by spreading ridges. We can use marine magnetic anomalies in between those plates to reconstruct the plates, and then we can take data from one plate and transfer it to another plate. In this type of way, we can use hotspot predictions from one plate and predict what a hotspot should look like on another plate. Uh, next slide. This is an example from uh, Steve Candy and others, and this was done um, uh, most prominently by um, Atwater and Molnar in 1973, but this is a, a version from 95, and interestingly, I think the, the, 
the conclusions of this haven't really changed very much, and there are, have been even um, uh, more updates since. And that is, if you take data from the Indo um, Indo-Atlantic region through a plate circuit and try to predict what the Hawaiian hotspot tra pack um, trace should have looked like. That is, what would a trace of a fixed hotspot look like um, used, predicted by data from the Indo-Atlantic realm? What you find is you get pretty good agreement for the first 30 to 35 million years. Um, and that's shown by the circles of confidence um, and the black line on top of the actual uh, trace of the seamounts themselves. But once you get past about 30 million years, you start seeing that there's pretty significant divergences. And by the time you get to, for example, eight, uh, 60 million years, the difference between the predictions and the actual track are, are very large. So um, this is the type of data set that has been around for some 30 years, suggesting that perhaps the Hawaiian hotspot uh, was not fixed. Uh, next slide. Well, why were those things not accepted? Um, they weren't accepted, as we'll, we'll touch on a little bit later. Um, is The main reason is because the, that type of plate circuit had to go through Antarctica. And there was some feeling, uh, certainly 30 years ago, and um, there have been arguments ever since, that there's some aspect of Antarctic geology that um, precludes us from making a plate circuit or uh, calls into question some, some issue of, of, of the plate circuit itself. Another way to look at this problem is, is actually quite independent, and that is to use a paleomagnetic approach. Uh, next slide. Now, let's uh, kind of dwell, get into some of the details. Um, the Earth's magnetic field is a, a time-varying and a, um, a spatially-varying quantity. Um, as uh, shown in this uh, uh, spherical harmonic analysis uh, representation of the Earth's magnetic field. Now, the important point here is, is simply that uh, if you look at those, uh, the tail end of that equation, the GLM, cosine, uh, and theta, we're talking about, um, these are called the Gauss coefficients, and they represent the time varying and spatially varying uh, components of the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, that means that we normally think about the Earth's magnetic field being a dipole, that's actually shown uh, by the picture, figure of the Earth and the dipole trace of the field. That is the simple pattern of a field that would be produced, for example, if, it would be, uh, if the Earth's magnetic field were due to a dipole, a bar magnet, at the Earth's center. The Earth's mag uh, magnetic field, of course, is not a permanent field like a dipole, but it is actually produced by um, convecting iron in the outer core. But nonetheless, what we find is if we average over sufficient time, we can actually get to this dipole figure. Um, so just to emphasize that, let's go to the next one. So a good way to think about this and what is shown in um, the small diagrams is just some snapshots of different uh, components of the Earth's magnetic field uh, for the year uh, 2000. Today, the Earth's magnetic field is 80% dipolar, that simple figure that you see in the upper um, uh, left, and 20% non-dipolar. You can think about the 20% non-dipolar field as um, a good analogy would be weather patterns. They basically are highs and lows that kind of migrate around the, the Earth. But if you average over enough time, those things are going to average out. Uh, and that's the challenge in using paleomagnetic data. We have to be very careful that we have averaged out those short-term uh, variations of the Earth's magnetic field. These things vary on years to perhaps hundreds of years, um, time scales to get at the dipole component of the field. Okay, next slide. Another thing is, is what you're actually using to record the ancient Earth's magnetic field. Uh, it turns out that uh, in Hawaii, of course, you have some of the best magnetic recorders in the world. Um, lavas turn out to be the best recorders uh, because we have solid uh, theory uh, called thermal remnant magnetization theory that describes uh, how the magnetization is uh, acquired and how it is retained. Again, the, the equation um, to just the, uh, simplify and point out the, um, the key elements here, tau is a relaxation time, and that is related to a whole series of magnetic parameters. Uh, those magnetic parameters are actually something we can measure in laboratories, uh, and that's a whole uh, subdiscipline that we call rock magnetism. 
Uh, we can use magnetic hysteresis measurements, uh, magnetic susceptibility measurements, Curie temperature measurements, there's a whole range of things that we look at on the magnetic carriers and particularly in lavas, which tend to be very good magnetic uh, recorders, to uh, see that they are suitable recorders. If we have magnetic recorders that are um, what we call single domain, small magnetic particles, they can have relaxation times that are as old as the Earth. So these tend out to, to be our best magnetic recorders. Uh, next. Now, if we are sampling magnetic recorders, we want to get this time average field. So um, to get a good feeling for that, uh, let's take a look at the upper left hand um, um, recording. If we just take the record from a single lava flow, that is going to have this dipolar component of the magnetization, and it's going to have the non-dipolar field component. So if we take a series of lava flows, we'll get a scatter of directions, and that is shown in the upper uh, stereo net. It's only uh, until we average those together that we can actually get the time average field value, in this case for that, the uh, modern field, which would be the spin axis location. So that's what we actually want. We want to average together uh, several uh, magnetic recorders, uh, over time, and this over several uh, the dipole um, figure of the field, which allows us to use the simple uh, tangent of the inclination equals two times the tangent of uh, the paleo latitude or lambda, which is shown in the graph at the bottom, to determine um, paleo latitudes from paleomagnetic inclinations. So that's how we go about uh, doing uh, our business, that basically we have to get enough lava flows that we have an average of the Earth's magnetic field. Okay, next. So, um, how do we go back and actually test this? Uh, this, is, uh, this will be very brief, but um, you might ask yourselves, well, maybe the field has not always, the time average field has always not been dipolar. How, how do we go back and, and kind of cross-validating this, this assumption? Well, there are several ways to do this. Um, one way to do this, uh, next slide, is um, to actually do um, latitude transects. Uh, this is uh, just an example I'll give from something that, that we published um, uh, a number of years ago, where we looked um, at lavas that were composed, uh, that were deposited at different latitudes. And if we look at um, the paleomagnetic records from those at different latitudes, we can actually uh, test the actual, directly, the field geometry. In this case, we were looking at uh, lavas in the Arctic. Uh, next slide. And uh, this is published in the Proceedings of the National Academy in 2002, but um, what is shown here is essentially if we, we look at that, those directions in a latitude of transect, those directions for the Arctic, we had values from lower latitudes. We can test for these more complicated ge geometric patterns of the Earth's magnetic field. Um, the simplest pattern is the dipole. That gives us the simple dipole equation. We can have octopoles. We can have quadrupoles. What is shown in the middle uh, figure is the actual formal test for an octopole field um, where we test to see the grouping assuming whether or not there was an octopole field present, and that's um, the horizontal axis. What you see is actually um, the grouping of the data, that's K, uh, falls off as we assume there's more and more um, octopole component. That is, uh, the simplest uh, explanation of the data is that there is no octopole component in that time average data for this data set. And this is a, a Cretaceous data set. So the conclusion of this um, uh, analysis was that for the Cretaceous, there is um, not much evidence for any octopole term at all, as well as any uh, quadrupole uh, field, um, which isn't shown here, but a, a similar analysis shows that. Uh, finally, uh, in part E is shown another way that we can actually look at this, and that is to actually look at the angular dispersion versus latitude. Um, if you look at, quickly, just jump over to part B, you'll see um, an example of the fact that these paleomagnetic directions from individual lavas don't define a single point, they, find, they define a scatter, and that's because each one of the points is reporting some dipole and non-dipole field. We have to average them together to get just the dipole field component. But that scatter of the directions has meaning. Uh, that's a, something we call the angular dispersion, and that versus latitude, which is shown in, in plot uh, E, that is um, the dispersion loads versus latitude, can also tell us about the structure of the Earth's magnetic field. And that's something we can use to test 
whether or not we have averaged enough time in an individual paleomagnetic database. What we do is essentially in a new paleomagnetic data set, we compare that versus global uh, compilations of uh, lava data sets. So that's quite a lot of uh, technical details, um, but I just want to give you a feeling for the fact that this is what um, is, is fairly standard. And, and of course, we're going to use this for tectonic implications, but there's a, there's a whole discipline of, of scientists who use this to study the Earth's magnetic field also. Okay, next. Okay, um, and finally, just part two there. Um, I gave you an example of latitudinal transect. We can also uh, do this by just looking at the distribution of paleomagnetic poles from all the continents if we wrote them, rotate them into a common reference frame, a common co continent. That is, by using the uh, anomalies that separate the continents, if we take all the paleomagnetic data and combine them to a single reference frame, uh, we can actually look at the distribution of those data to see if they are uh, dipolar or quadrupolar or, or so on. And a good reference for that is Cortio and Bess. Uh, it was published in, in the AGU Geographic uh, Monograph Series. And their conclusion is that they see no evidence for the octopole and only about uh, 3 plus or minus 2 percent for the quadrupole. Uh, that is an, an extremely small uh, component um, and uh, very close to the noise level. Okay, um, next. All right, back to the Hawaiian hotspot. Um, our work on this really started in um, looking at results from ODP Leg 145. Now, ODP Leg 145 was a paleoceanographic mission to uh, recover sediments from Detroit Seamount. Well, it turns out that they actually drilled deeply uh, through the sediment sequence and recovered some basalt at a, at a few sites. Um, uh, this is mainly due to the fact that David Ray, who was one of the co chief scientists, was uh, recognized the importance of this. Um, but these things, uh, these cores actually sat in the core locker for a long time and they weren't really um, properly analyzed because the crews, uh, most people on the crews uh, were after other uh, objectives, particularly paleoceanography. Next. When we sampled these, we were actually quite surprised uh, when we, we, um, we got our results. Uh, first, the results um, diverged from the predictions using the fixed hotspot, that's part B. Um, and what is shown here is uh, several different ways of grouping the data together. If we take the lava flows there, we may consider that they have 10 independent groups, 11 independent groups, 12 independent groups. Um, I'll get to that a little bit more when we talk about leg 197, but this is the question about how you define whether a lava is actually time independent relative to an adjacent lava. In this paper, we uh, gave a range of values between 10 to, to 12 uh, independent groups. B shows that the paleo latitudes that were recorded from these lavas were very different from the present day latitude in Hawaii. They were also very different from previous ideas of the Pacific apparent polar water path, which was uh, particularly interesting. And in part C, we showed that the dispersion of the data seemed to be similar to what we had knew from global paleomagnetic data at the time of the, uh, lavas of the same age. These lavas were approximately uh, 81 million years old, and they seem to agree very well with uh, the scatter that would be seen in lavas of that age on a global basis, suggesting that they had averaged enough time to use um, the data for paleolatitude determinations. Now, let me just uh, talk a little bit about the difference between these data and the previous ideas of the Pacific Parampolar Wanda Paths, because this is going to be an, an important uh, question later on. What you can see in the globe figure is the paleo co-latitude now from uh, these new values from Detroit Seamount. Uh, the data do not have azimuthal orientation uh, because they are from deep sea cores, and instead they just define a co-latitude value. Uh, that's that red line and with the blue uncertainty region. That is distinct from previous ideas of the Pacific Parampolar Wanda path of things that were supposed to be the same age as shown in the, um, the small circles. Okay, next slide. So, how could these previous poles be so wrong? Um, and they were really based on remote sensing data, and I think that kind of is a nice segue into thinking about the difference between the remote sensing data and, and the true paleomagnetic data. 
Next slide. Okay, there's a lot on this slide. Um, I apologize for that, but um, let me just briefly go through it. And that is that the remote sensing data have uh, two uh, types. Um, there is uh, magnetic pole data from C mounts, as well as data from um, um, remagnetic anomalies. One thing I do want to stretch, stress here is that the confidence in intervals on these poles from remote sensing data are not the same as confidence intervals that I'll be presenting today. Um, the confidence intervals on these poles from the remote sensing data are some estimate of a goodness of fit value representing one particular model to fit the data rather than uh, the more formal interpretation of the data uh, uncertainty regions that is associated with paleomagnetic data. My interpretation is that much of these data were very useful in the beginning of our approaches to looking at some of these problems. I think they lack the resolution for some of the tests of hotspot motion, or at the very least, you should be aware of the differences between these data and the paleomagnetic data, which are based on um, field samples taken to laboratories, rock magnetic, paleomagnetic analyses, uh, thermal remnant magnetization uh, theory, and the fact that the confidence intervals are actually telling us something about the Earth's magnetic field. They're not telling us something about um, the model itself. Okay, next. Um, okay, this is, uh, I've already said that. Uh, next. Um, not unique is the C-mount anomalies. Um, this is one of the, the, the serious problems that, and really the reason for that divergence between um, the paleomagnetic data um, that were collected from the droid C-mount and then previous ideas of the, of the apparent polar wander path. Uh, that is when we measure an um, anomaly over a C-mount, we're looking um, not like at, at all what we measure in, in uh, paleomagnetic uh, laboratory, we're looking at a sum of the magnetizations of the present magnetic field, some induced components of magnetization uh, that is induced by the presence magnetic field, some viscous component of magnetization, something that is, has slightly long time scales that the magnetic grains are picking up. There can be differences in polarity in the C-mount. We know this from drilling that sometimes there are magnetic reversals recorded. And this is all in a total magnetization um, that is produced when you tow a magnetometer over a C-mount. And you have to somehow figure this out uh, of the relative components. And in particular, uh, these errors are not random because there can be a bias due to the Earth's magnetic field and its viscous components of magnetization. So um, this is actually a truly difficult problem and a non-unique one. Um, Bob Parker has done some particularly um, good work on this in a paper that he published in JGR in 1991, and he highlighted the non-uniqueness of, of this uh, approach. Next slide. Now, this is very different from the paleomagnetic approach because we take individual samples and we use shielded magnetometers. Um, this is an example of the magnetometer on the Joides resolution. And that shielding, um, that's that silver uh, um, shine in that, um, uh, that can, if you will, which you see, um, which is actually a magnetometer. Those are actually very expensive magnetic shields that are shielding uh, samples from the Earth's magnetic field. So we exclude induced components of the magnetization. Uh, next slide. Um, we also do this in magnetically shielded rooms when we're at, not at sea, when we're actually um, in laboratories at Hawaii. We have a particularly nice one. Um, we've um, uh, constructed one, and I've actually give the students a feel for the actual inside of a magnetic shielded room during its construction. This is actually uh, one layer of three magnetic layers um, that shield uh, the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, next. And inside that we put the really expensive layer. Uh, you never see these things because they're actually covered up by walls later on. But in this case we're taking the Earth's magnetic field which is 50 to 60,000 nanoteslas and it's reduced to less than 200 nanoteslas. So we are essentially, uh, and then we put magnetometers inside that reduce the field even more. So we're really excluding that induced component of the magnetization. Next slide. Um, then we take our samples and we um, do demagnetizations. And we do demagnetizations by alternating field methods, 
Uh, next slide. And we do them by thermal methods. Um, and we do this because we want to strip out this viscous component of magnetization, something that has a magnetization with slightly longer time scales, but something that, again, that can confuse the magnetization if you don't remove it. So we do, uh, we spend a lot of time removing these components of magnetizations that are inherently part of a total uh, anomaly that you might collect over a seamount out at sea. So there's a fundamental difference in this remote sensing data and what we collect uh, on land or, or at sea in a paleomagnetic laboratory. Uh, next slide. Now, um, I'll just briefly mention this, uh, which gets to a, a question. Uh, this is a good reference if you want to follow this up, uh, a comment that uh, Rory Cortrell and I published in Science in 2000. Um, next slide. The crux of the matter is simply this. Um, because of the uncertainties involved in some of the remote sensing data, you have model choices. And one of the choices you could make is let's choose the model that is closest to. This is an example of um, how some authors actually changed paleomagnetic pole, um, or not paleomagnetic poles, poles based on remote sensing data, particularly from that 90, uh, 82 million year old pole to create a new pole position at 84 MA, uh, in this case east, which was closer to the new value from Detroit's seamount. You can do this, uh, certainly that's within the model range and parameter range. Uh, you then have to ask yourself whether or not you're looking at data sets now that are independent. Um, and you can also do this, uh, you can choose from this large range of parameter space to find something that is closest to a fixed hotspot model. And that's where things get pretty difficult and pretty confusing, to actually um, ask yourself whether or not these data are truly independent observations or have uh, they been used or have the models actually been constructed with some uh, model in mind. And sometimes it's not clear because the parameter space is actually uh, quite uh, wide for the choice uh, of the models. Uh, next slide. I think the, the same thing uh, um, applies to magnetic anomaly skewness. Um, and in this particular case, what we see is that there are two types. The raw data, uh, that is the raw, what we call unskewed data from um, anomalies, uh, do not give us paleolatitudes. We recognize there is some anomalous component, uh, which is due to some complicated processes that are uh, Ridgecrest um, related. So we have to uh, put in this anomalous component to produce a paleomagnetic pole position. The important point here is that that uh, translation from the unskewed to the skewed position is not normally included in the error budget of the poles that are published. Um, I think it should be because it's basically an unknown. Uh, so sometimes you'll see these uh, poles that are published and they have very small confidence intervals and I think they're a gross underestimate of the true uncertainty. Um, you don't have to take my opinion on that, of course. Um, uh, next slide. Uh, a nice summary of this is uh, published in De Veneer and Kent. Um, well, they actually had a nice summary of, of looking at the Pacific Indo-Atlantic hotspots. And uh, they similarly conclude that the accuracy of the skewed poles is, is probably uh, similar to that of the, the seamounts. They're both affected by some systematic biases that are imprecisely known. So uh, this is an important thing to, to keep in mind as you go forward and think about uh, what is actually constraining um, motion of plates and what is actually independent from a model. Okay, uh, next. All right. Let's get back to Hawaii again. So, um, it, it turns out that soon after we published our paper, um, most workers, and I think all uh, workers, have, have um, disregarded these 82 and 80 million, 81 million year old poles. They recognized that, in fact, they did have biases and they constructed new poles. Uh, that's the tricky point about whether or not you accept uh, that approach. But the really striking thing about the data sets, uh, just taken alone, is of course the difference from the present day latitude of Hawaii. Um, you know, why are these things so different? Next slide. And what we proposed was a test, um, or just a way to look at the data. And what you see here on this plot is latitude versus age. Uh, 
And the red um, um, diagrams are, or the red uh, points, are just the present-day locations of the uh, Emperor's Seamounts. And what we've done here is we have slid that red line down to form that blue line. And uh, you can think about this in the upper right-hand corner is just uh, showing that little plot. And imagine just taking the Meiji to um, uh, bend uh, trend and slide it down to the latitude of Hawaii. The reason we've done this is we want to exclude any latitudinal components uh, do, along the construction of, of Hawaiian trend to ask ourselves a very simple question. Um, in this type of plot, if the Hawaiian hotspot had been fixed, uh, the paleo latitude values that we should get should, should fall on that solid horizontal line at about 19 degrees marking Hawaii. If the um, Emperor Seamounts recorded solely motion of the Hawaiian hotspot on Earth's mantle, the paleo latitude values should fall uh, along the blue line. We only have two data sets at that time. One is the data set from the Detroit Seamount at 81 million years, and the other one is from a Suico Seamount, which is at, uh, in this plot, it was thought to be 65 million years. Now we know it's about 61 million years. Um, these are just two points on an XY plot, but um, these are actually the summary of many lava flows. So uh, many of the types of demagnetization data I've talked about, some data sets that are, that are composed to give us that, that paleo-latitude value. Um, what you see is that they're nowhere near the horizontal line of Hawaii. Uh, in fact, they're much closer to the total uh, motion line, suggesting motion of the um, hot spot, perhaps with some residual component of plate motion um, involved. And that was our interpretation, um, that basically what we're looking at is the motion of a hot spot uh, in Earth's mantle uh, during the construction of the Emperor Seamounts. Uh, next slide. Now, uh, interestingly, uh, quite independently, um, we published our paper and another group was um, working on mantle dynamic modeling of uh, the Hawaiian hotspots and all hotspots, and you'll hear from those, I guess, in your next lecture brought uh, by uh, Bernard uh, Steinberger, working with Rick O'Connell. And they also uh, concluded that uh, hotspots um, had moved, in particular the Hawaiian hotspot had moved south. And this was summarized in a nice uh, kind of news and views article by uh, Yurik uh, Christensen, uh, Fixed Hotspots Gone with the Wind. So you might ask yourselves, well, okay, uh, how was this um, received by the community who were using the fixed hotspot reference frame? Uh, next slide. Well, um, as I try to tell my students, sometimes you have to be patient. Um, there are a lot of very smart people out there, and I'm trying to guide them into uh, a different way of thinking uh, can be an arduous task. Essentially, we had a consistent uh, argument based on our data, but and even though we had spent uh, a huge amount of time collecting these data, as shown on the previous plot, um, we really only had two points when we looked at an XY plot. The data set from Detroit Seamount, the Detroit set from um, uh, the previous data set by Suikos. So uh, I think the community really wanted to, to have more, and that was the start of our effort to uh, get more by uh, going out and looking at ocean drilling. Uh, next slide. So we used the Joides resolution um, in a standard uh, drilling operation. Uh, we wrote a proposal. Next slide which became um, the ocean drilling leg uh, 197, a motion of the Hawaiian hotspot, a paleomagnetic test, uh, and we sailed in 2001. Uh, next. We did a few things that were different uh, than previous cruises, um, and if I had to identify one reason, uh, well, there really are two, <laughs> but because uh, they're closely related, but the two reasons we don't know more about the motions of oceanic plates from ocean drilling are, are, are pretty simple. One is that we haven't drilled in pretty boring places. As a paleomagnetist, you want to drill in a boring place being you want to have a nice flat series of one and a half faults in it, which might be tectonically interesting for someone else, because you can't uh, tolerate that type of error. You want to have a nice uh, um, flat series of lavas to, um, to do your paleomagnetic studies.
And you need to drill deep enough that you get enough lavas that you can get a time average of the Earth's magnetic field. Those are the two key parameters. Um, prior to drilling, uh, and, Matt, and in fact immediately prior to putting the pipe down, we did these little surveys. Uh, Dave Scholl led that effort to actually ensure that we had flat-lying lavas uh, exactly where we were drilling. Uh, next slide. Um, we adopted um, a, a set of measurements on board the ship um, where we, uh, we didn't use any what we call scanning data. A lot of times data that are collected on the ship are just to give you a broad brush idea of whether or not the magnetization is stable or not. We actually did um, discrete demagnetizations of discrete samples, um, basically trying to approach data to get things of the highest resolution, approaching things that we would see in the laboratory. So we had no scanning data, and we basically demagnetized samples, um, and what are shown here are what we call orthogonal vector plots of the demagnetization data, which were actually quite nice. Uh, next slide. An important part of this cruise was that we used, um, in a party of petrologists and a uh, volcanologist, we used shipboard petro petrologic data and geochemical data. Uh, data that was actually being produced on the lavas as they were coming, uh, being retrieved, retrieved, to group the cooling units into time units. Now, what's the difference there? Well, it turns out that, let's take the example of Kilauea uh, eruptions, which uh, you're all familiar with. Um, the Kilauea eruptions, we could go out um, and drill a hole through the lava benches in Kilauea. And we could see and, and retrieve lavas. And we could see that there would be individual little cooling um, boundaries in between uh, small pieces of lava. Now, you might think, uh, if you didn't know anything about the Kilauea eruptions and you just had this core, that there was a substantial amount of time separating these, these cooling units. Well, in fact, um, all these cooling units could be deposited within 10 years, which for a paleomagnetist is a, um, the number of observations is one. Uh, it doesn't matter how many of them you have, you're just really looking at a snapshot of the Earth's magnetic field. So you have to be very careful not to, to assume that a cooling unit is an independent record of the Earth's magnetic field. So the way that we did this is to reconstruct um, the volcanic architecture. This was done by Thor, uh, Thor Sarsten. And to use geochemical data as another check uh, to see the, um, that we had differences in the geochemistry in between these different lava packages. And that's the fundamental basis that we use to divide up the lavas. Um, there were also geological factors. Uh, we actually looked at lavas that were separated by soil horizons and sediment horizons and a whole range of geological parameters. In some cases, we drilled 100, almost 100 meters of lava and we, ha we averaged all the data together. It was a very conservative approach. Uh, next slide. Ultimately, we derived these time average data um, and these, these lava time units and used the detailed demagnetization data to derive uh, uh, paleolatitude values, which shown here is an example from one of the sites. Uh, the blue are the actual data from these individual time units. Uh, the purple in the background is a um, distribution, uh, something we call a Fisher distribution, which has the same statistical characteristics as those blue data. And from those, we can get a, uh, an average value, um, in this particular case from uh, site uh, 1206A, which was just slightly steeper than the predicted value from Hawaii. So that's the basic type of data that we collected. We collected uh, what we call alternating field demagnetization on board the ship, and then we collected an, an entire new data set uh, in laboratories on land using thermal demagnetization, using both techniques. Next slide. Okay, um, the sites that we looked at were uh, from Detroit Seamount, the far north, um, and um, sort of near the middle of the chain, something called uh, Toco Seamount, and toward the end of the train, um, uh, Coco Seamount, site 1206 there. Next slide. This is the ensemble of data that we collected. Uh, the blue points are the alternating field demagnetization, the red are the thermal demagnetization. Uh, there's a few other things thrown in there. There's a purple data set in 1205 that was actually from some um, uh, soil horizons. Um, and uh, several different types of estimates from Detroit Seamount based on individual sites. Uh, we also had an estimate from some sediments. When we use averaging of these data, averaging 
together the Detroit Seamount, um, and the details of which are explained in, um, in the paper in Science, we basically got a, a picture that is uh, very similar to what we uh, had predicted um, based just on the Detroit analysis alone, that we are looking at a latitudinal trend um, that uh, rather than being a fixed hotspot, that horizontal line, we're seeing a change um, of latitude with time, which is something that you would not predict from a, a fixed hotspot and closer to this total moving hotspot line, perhaps with some components of plate motion um, superimposed on top. Okay, um, next slide. Um, just um, a brief point here. Um, these, this is actually a paper that I'll just point out for some of those of you who may be interested in, in this. Um, it was published in Tectonal Physics in 2003. This is actually a paper that was based on data prior to late 197. But in this paper, Rory Cottrell, I think, nicely points out a few things. Um, and particularly that history that is um, looked at, if you will, in an apparent polar wanda sense, can be explained in terms of normal uh, ridge driving forces. And I'm not going to say very much more about that. Um, I'm sorry, normal plate driving forces, particularly uh, the subduction of plates, as uh, uh, where the slabs are located. And uh, that seems to give us a pretty good idea of, of um, the plate motion history and uh, the data and everything we're going to talk about in, in um, the hotspot modeling um, is not, um, uh, there's no contradiction there whatsoever. The other point about this paper is that uh, at about the, the oldest end of the Hawaiian um, emperor track that we have available to us, it's actually pretty close to a ridge axis. And that uh, may become important later if people have some questions. Okay. Um, as I mentioned early on, um, Bernard Steinberger, who will be talking to you uh, next, um, had been doing some modeling and, um, of the motion of plumes within the convective mantle and had come up with a motion model, which is shown in, in Part A, which is um, close to um, explaining, I think we're off a slide here, I'm on slide 47. Um, that's pretty close to explaining the, um, the characteristics of the paleo latitude, that is part B there, that latitude versus age plot. There's a slight mismatch in Detroit's seamount, uh, but to first order, it's a fairly good match uh, of his independent uh, geodynamic modeling and the actual observations that we see. Uh, next slide. So, um, Bernard again will talk to you about his models, which are shown on the far right in terms of the evection of the tilted plume con conduit. Um, and that at least uh, is a starting point for understanding how uh, the emperor trend may have originated. Um, and I'll return to that a little bit later uh, in the talk. Now, uh, next slide. One thing I do want to point out is that um, for many of you, uh, you may not be familiar with paleomagnetic data. Uh, you may be uh, familiar more with coral reefs. And uh, that's one of the uh, nice consistency tests about looking at the paleomagnetic data uh, versus the geology. And we now have enough sites on the Amper uh, trend that I think it's a, it's, it's a fairly um, good observation that the fact that we really see uh, the last corals, and corals are uh, to first order control by um, uh, temperature and then there, therefore latitude, at um, about the, the bend, or just slightly north in Coco Seamount. As we move further north, we lose the corals, suggesting that they were actually formed at seamounts at more northerly cooler waters. Uh, that would be compatible with a hotspot drift hypothesis. So the geology uh, seems to be uh, confirming that there is a latitudinal trend um, uh, present. Okay, next slide. Okay, our last tutorial. Um, what are the implications of this for um, something called polar wander? And uh, the title of my talk was The Motion of Plates. Um, Paleobagic data, of course, are, uh, are fundamental for continental drift. For hotspots, we're actually well in the middle of talking about that. But I also talked about the entire solid earth. Uh, the entire solid earth is this concept of polar wander. Uh, next slide. It turns out that polar wander has a very long history. Um, well, maybe not so long. Uh, it was discussed in uh, the early um, uh, consideration of plate tectonics. 
when the first apparent pole of wander paths were uh, being constructed, um, and this is uh, nicely discussed in Ted Irving's book in 1964, there was a big question. If you just have one apparent polar wander path, um, is this continental drift? Is this actually a polar wander? Now, unfortunately, polar wander is a very confusing term. Um, I think to, to particularly for students, it's actually a confusing term for, for many professionals because the implication here is that the Earth's magnetic field is moving all over the place. In fact, it's not at all. Um, true polar wander, or, or polar wander more correctly, is the rotation of the entire Earth with respect to a fixed spin axis. And that's shown in this kind of whimsical cartoon at the right. The idea in uh, this classic paper by Goldrich and Toome in 1969 is let's imagine that you have these giant beetles uh, ro roaming around uh, the Earth. Um, they're actually going to change the moments of inertia of Earth and there will be a rotation of the entire solid figure of the Earth relative to its spin axis. Now, the Earth doesn't have these giant roaming beetles, uh, not at least that big, um, but we do have changing um, mass heterogeneities within the Earth, like subduction zones, and maybe these things could actually drive this type of rotation. Uh, it's, it's possible. Um, there's, uh, I think, still some questions about the time scales involved in that, and we certainly see smaller um, um, this effects of this type of polar wander due to a glacial... Uh, um, affects uh, melting of ice. The question is whether or not it would actually accumulate into be a very long-term signal. Okay, next slide. Um, this kind of reviews a little bit about the history of this. I, I mentioned that early on it was a very big concern because in the parapole long path you didn't know whether or not you were looking at um, continental motion or you were looking at just the entire rotation of the solid earth. Well, it turns out that was pretty quickly saw, saw by when you had multiple apparent polar wand paths, it was clear that, that plate tectonics was the actual cause of, of what we were seeing in apparent polar wander. And polar wander was in, indeed a very small term. And um, early tests, again, using the um, uh, somewhat similar to the, the latitudinal transects I said, but, but looking at distribution of paleomagnetic data from the continents, came to the conclusion in the 70s that there was no significant polar wander since the early Cretaceous. Then something changed. There was a change in the community and there was even a new term coined, uh, something called true polar wander. Now this is where things start to get confusing. Um, now what we're going to do is we're going to look at paleomagnetic data in a fixed hotspot reference frame. And now we're going to, if we see motion, we're going to call this true polar wander. Now it's very important to remember that that assumes that there is a fixed hotspot reference frame. And I'll explain uh, how this is actually done next. Next slide. Okay, here's how you do it. This is what is commonly called a true polar wander path. And um, here's the methodology. Let's take paleomagnetic data from all the continents. Okay. And as I mentioned earlier, we can combine these data into a single continent just by closing up the oceans using marine magnetic anomalies. We're going to gather all the data together into a single continent to increase our resolution of, um, of the record and also do some spatial averaging. Uh, typically, that reference continent is taken to be uh, Africa. So we're going to combine all the data together. Then we're going to basically subtract out the plate motion component, assuming that hotspots have been fixed. We're going to use a fixed hotspot reference frame to ext extract out the plate motion component. Now, if we do those things exactly correctly, that is, um, the, there's been no motion of the hotspots and there's been no motion of the Earth, then all the paleomagnetic poles should fall right on top of the spin axis. And you can see from this plot that for the very youngest ages, they sort of do feel fall close to the spin axis. But then they start to wander off. And that's what's been known as true polar wander, basically at 50, 65, and then in this particular version at 160, it's very far off from the spin axis. And the interpretation of this by these authors has been that that is actually recording a rotation of the entire solid Earth. But let's remember it's actually done in a fixed hotspot reference frame. Okay, next slide. 
It turns out that there are some differences um, in these quote unquote true polar wand of curves uh, that have been published over the years, but there are some similarities, and there should be some similarities because they're all using the same uh, hotspot reference frame, and the paleomagnetic data hasn't really changed all that much. Uh, next. But our two possibilities are actually shown here in this cartoon. Um, one is that we have a solid rotation of the entire Earth on the lower left, and the other is that, well, maybe it's the hotspot reference frame itself that is actually the thing that's doing the moving. Next slide. Well, how do you test this? Well, the way you test this is by doing global tests. And the um, nice thing about these hypotheses is, particularly the true polar wander hypotheses, is they make global predictions of how the um, paleolatitude chains should occur throughout the Earth. And it turns out that this is actually the way that we, uh, my group, first got involved in studying hotspot motion is we were actually testing a true polar wander model. And uh, this was in a paper that Jeff Gee and I wrote in 1995, published in Nature. And we found that that true polar wander model failed. And it had to be a, a question of the reference frame. Um, what is shown here is a series of papers that uh, essentially also uh, come to very similar conclusions questioning uh, the true polar wander or the polar wander physical mechanism because there's inconsistencies when you look at these uh, with global paleomagnetic data. Okay, next slide. Um, and I think a nice way to actually look at this is um, to look at um, the most recent argument for this. And uh, I, I like this example because the authors actually changed their minds uh, from 2002 to 2003. Uh, this is a paper by Besson Cortillo, who was published in 2002, and um, they argued that, in fact, there was a significant component of, of true polar wander. Um, but what is shown here is, is two true polar wanders, which is sort of an odd thing, but if you understand the definition, you understand where, where this comes from. In A, what you see is the paleomagnetic data reference to the um, from the Pacific, reference to Pacific hotspots, and B is data from the Indo-Atlantic continents, reference to uh, those hotspots. So you have two different true polar wander curves. Now, if true polar wander is polar wander, the rotation of the solid Earth, you shouldn't have two curves. You should just have one curve. So we can now compare these two. Next slide. And interestingly enough, when we compare the two and part A and B, we see the curves actually aren't going in the same direction. So these cannot be polar wander. Uh, this has to be um, something else. And it has to be, in this case, um, uh, a problem with the reference frame and motion of the hotspots. Okay, uh, next slide. And it turns out that the authors, at least the first author of that paper, then basically uh, fessed up. He basically said, uh, wrote another paper saying that on closer inspection, it's found that the true polar wander pole positions for the two hemispheres are significantly displaced. Uh, what does that mean? That means that it's not polar wander. It has to be a problem with the reference frame and the problem with uh, the hotspots itself. So the conclusion here really is that um, you have to be very careful at at, at making some inferences about polar wander using um, a hotspot reference frame, uh, if we use global tests to look at um, the polar wander hypothesis, we find, uh, well, we have yet to find an interval in the last 90 million years that is above the noise level. Uh, every time it fails, and it seems to in instead be a question of the reference frame. Another way to look at this, perhaps, is that um, can we find an interval during that time interval where the paleomagnetic data all show trends that would be indicating polar one? In fact, they don't. Okay, next slide. So, uh, that's just what I just told you. Um, uh, so, uh, next slide. Uh, just to, to end this kind of long tutorial. Um, Polar wander is a really fascinating thing. It's fascinating, I think, both for its, its process and it's, uh, I think, a fascinating thing in terms of how scientists approach things. Um, it's uh, sort of uh, what I sometimes call the antithesis of plate tectonics. In plate tectonics, we had all this geological information screaming at us, telling us that it occurred. 
and we didn't have a driving mechanism. For polar wander, we have a driving mechanism, but we don't have any evidence that it occurred. So maybe it occurred uh, in the Paleozoic, maybe it occurred very early in the Earth, but uh, right now, when we look in the last 90 million years, it, it's uh, a search that we just don't seem to have uh, any evidence for that process occurring. Okay, uh, next slide. Back to Hawaii. I'd like um, you to view the Hawaiian Emperor track in um, a different way. Think about what if it had the hotspot had been fixed. Now I've given you quite a bit of data so far suggesting that it's not fixed. How can, can we actually use that data and some other things to uh, imagine what the Hawaiian hotspot would have looked like if it had actually been fixed? Now, next slide. To get there, we're going to have to go into the question of plate circuits and analyzing the analysis of plate circuits. Uh, there are, in fact, two contain, uh, contending plate circuits right now, one that goes through Antarctica um, in the kind of standard track that goes from the Indo-Atlantic realm through Antarctica into the Pacific. There is a more recent track um, that goes through um, uh, uh, Antarctica through Australia to Lord Howe Rise into the Pacific. So there are these two tracks, both of which um, show um, substantial divergences from the, uh, the actual track uh, of the Hawaiian Emperor itself. Next slide. Now it turns out we can use paleomagnetic data to evaluate the accuracy of these plots. Uh, now there's been a lot of work done suggesting, uh, I think, addressing adequately this, this weak link, if you will, through Antarctica. Dietmar Mueller has done some excellent work in that area. So is Steve Candy and Joanne Stock and a whole series of scientists. Um, can paleomagnetism contribute to this at all? Well, one way that we can do uh, this, and this has recently been published by uh, Pavel Dubrovin in uh, Journal of Geophysical Research, is we can do consistency tests. We can look at paleomagnetic data from the uh, Atlantic bordering continents with the new paleomagnetic data that we have from Detroit uh, Seamount and other places, and look for some consistency, rotating them, uh, comparing those to da data, uh, comparing data from the Indo-Atlantic realm and the Pacific realm using the plate circuits. Essentially, if these two data, data sets agree, it's confidence that the plate circuit is accurate. If the plate circuit were grossly inaccurate, there should be big divergences between the two paleomagnetic data sets. And what is shown here is for um, roughly 76 million years, if we look at paleomagnetic data from the Atlantic boarding continent, those are circles, those are actually poles because they're truly azimuthal oriented data, versus the data from Detroit Seamount, we can see that there's actually very nice agreement between the two. Uh, next slide. For the younger time intervals, uh, there's nice agreement between the data from the Pacific and the highest resolution data from um, North America, again suggesting uh, accuracy of the plate motions. Uh, interestingly enough, as an aside, the data from Europe are not as well uh, matched. and there's a, I, We believe that there are some reasons uh, for this. But the North American data show very nice agreement, again, rotated through that plate circuit with the data from the Pacific. Uh, next slide. So in conclusion, uh, it turns out that both of the plate circuits are consistent with the paleomagnetic data, um, although there are some problems with some of the European data sets. And um, we also have some analyses of paleomagnetic data. This is published in a few places, in, including the data that um, the paper that uh, Jeff Gee and I wrote in '95, suggesting that there hasn't been much motion, latitudinal motion, of the Indo-Atlantic um, hotspots for the last 80, 90 million years. There's pretty big motion prior to that, not for the last 80, 90 million years. Using and combining those two observations, we can use plate circuits to tell us something about this past Hawaiian location. Um, hotspot locations, similar to what uh, Steve Candy and others had done uh, very early on. Okay, next slide. Uh, Sixty-seven, there we go. Okay, and here it is. And this is the picture that I would like you to think about. Um, now, essentially, what we're doing is we're imagining what the Hawaiian hotspot Track, track would it look like in a fixed hotspot sense. We have removed now 
this very drastic brand, bend of the Hawaiian Emperor track. It's replaced, uh, the 60 degree change is actually replaced by something more gentle, about 30 degrees. But the overall track, the overall trace, is much more similar to the traces of things that we see recording long-term plate motion on Earth. For example, an oceanic fracture zone. Um, we could have, uh, within this very long track, we could divide it up into segments, uh, separated by small circles, and those might be changes in plate motion. Certainly possible. Certainly within the realm of possibilities. So we're not excluding the fact that there are plate motion uh, changes in here. We would just say that if you go from A to C, really dramatic change here is the hot spot um, component of motion. Okay, next slide. One of the hot topics, I think, now, and that will continue for the next 10 years or, or more, is what exactly are the mantle processes for the hotspot motion in the bends and the hotspots? And uh, I'm just going to touch on this briefly. Um, next slide. Um, there's a reference to, to uh, the movie I'm about to, to show you in this Scientific American article that um, was published early in the year. And this is an example from... Um, um, Yorick uh, Hansen's group. Uh, if we can just uh, move to the movie and see if we can get that going. Now, this has this weird um, uh, long um, uh, projection for a reason to make things uh, more realistic in terms of the modeling. But uh, this is closest, closer to um, kind of the dynamic view of the mantle that uh, I think many people in mantle dy uh, dynamics think about. What we see here are plumes being generated from a basal layer uh, core mantle, near the core mantle boundary, if you will, and they're being influenced both by the mantle flow and they're actually being influenced by other plumes forming. So if you have a region of many hotspots forming uh, or plumes forming hotspots eventually in one particular region, they might be influenced, uh, and there might be some motion at the basal lo level. There might be some motion as they're actually penetrating up within the convecting mantle. Again, Bernard Steinberg will talk a lot about that. And you can see the plumes are actually bending over as they reach the surface. This is the type of model, it's just one particular case, that we think is um, uh, a potential explanation for some of the observations we're seeing in uh, the uh, emperor part of the Hawaiian Empire. Ben. Okay, uh, next slide. Um, just one thing to think about. Um, Hawaii is uh, actually a little bit of an outlier uh, when we think about the distribution of hotspots in the Pacific Ocean Basin. Um, most of them are down in the South Pacific. Um, could the Hawaiian hotspot have actually moved in, rel in a relative sense due to this larger ups um, upflow uh, upwelling due to the formation of these other hotspots. That's just speculation, but at least something to, to think about and maybe something that can be explored more in, in future modeling. And I think uh, Yorick Hansen is, is thinking along these lines. Uh, next slide. Um, just a little bit about some future tests. Uh, there's a lot more to do, always. Uh, next. Um, one of the places that we're working is um, a rare place uh, that actually has um, uh, has the Pacific Plate above water, like Hawaii, but it's a rare place because it's actually old. Uh, this is some place called the Chatham Islands, and um, it's uh, a little bit older, but similar in age to the oldest part of the Emperor Track, uh, called the Troy Sea. Uh, next. Uh, Chatham Island, uh, we've been there recently, and there are lava flows uh, exposed there. Uh, next. And I think it's, it's places like this that we could actually go. Here are some lavas exposed on um, an island called Pitt Island um, that are late Cretaceous in age, that we can get more paleomagnetic data to increase our resolution. Um, we also uh, hope that there's going to be more ocean drilling, um, both in other hotspot tracks, uh, particularly Louisville, and also um, maybe Hawaii in the future. And I think one thing I want to point out about um, Lake 197 is that Lake 197 was 
really designed to test whether or not there had been hotspot motion or not. When you get to a more detailed discussion of rates, uh, particularly rates of motion within the Emperor trend, that's a much more difficult question. It's actually a very different uh, drilling objective that requires much deeper drilling. And I'll just mention that in case it comes up in the question period, because uh, I think there have been some over-interpretations of even some of our data, because again, we were really trying to test whether or not the hotspot had moved or not, trying to get the exact um, motion rate within the trend, for example, is a very difficult thing to do because we have to deal with the fundamental uncertainties associated with the Earth's magnetic field. Okay, next slide. Okay, uh, in summary, uh, two very simple points. Um, paleomagnetism defines both plate and hotspot motion. Uh, that means we can uh, go to certain places and both look at plate, the conventional way of looking at things, but uh, wonderful places by looking at individual tracks and uh, really study this uh, hotspot motion um, phenomena. I could have said we can also use paleomagnetism to study polar water, and we can, but the point is that every test that we have done so far in a global nature over the last, at least for the last 90 million years, uh, suggests that that's not a signal that is jumping out at us yet. We can't really see anything. Um, beyond the efforts, I think, to really increase the data resolution, uh, which these are very important things, I think the really future challenge is really one of determining which mantle process it is. You know, are we talking about a deep mantle process, a mid mantle process, or a low mantle process? Uh, many uh, maybe things all combine. Uh, the shallow processes, of course, mean, uh, as we should expect, there should be some coupling of, of sufficient processes with mantle convention. Really trying to tease these things out is the really future um, challenge and the real excitement about looking at uh, the records of host hotspot motion uh, that we can, con uh, we can uh, observe using paleomagnetic data. So I think I'll leave it there and thank everyone for their attention and take any questions.